Hey everybody, happy Monday. It's another Maker Monday and I'm Chris Bakke with NASCO Education. Um, one of the very first questions that we got before we even started was what does NASCO stand for? And NASCO um, is NASCO now. And it um, is an acronym that has now become a title of who we are, but it originally stood for the National Agricultural Supply Company. Um, it was a, a gentleman who had farming background and wanted to start um, a farm catalog. The, um, the irony is that he was a VOAG teacher. So education was absolutely near and dear to his heart. And so as the um, farm and ranch catalog um, became successful, he had the opportunity to purchase into education um, and it, we were a catalog company for a very long time. So now we are NASCO Education and we have a wide variety of categories that we represent um, both through um, a physical catalog um, and also on um, online presence. And we are adding to um, with uh, adding to our um, selection all the time and we're adding digital curriculum nasco educate is a k to career platform that we have if you're interested in a free trial for that um, please um, let us know and i can get you set up for that um, but today i want to talk a little bit about um, education and art is the intersection where all subjects meet. And that was a quote by the art ed guru. Um, and at the time it was in a post and it said the box artist. And so I sent a message to the box artist who would um, become the art ed guru um, and working under two different aliases at the time. Um, and I met Eric Gibbons. And so today, um, Eric is going to be sharing um, the book, The Emotional Color Wheel. I happen to be holding the elementary version, but there is an elementary and a regular. Um, this is fabulous for distance learning. It is fabulous for social emotional learning. And I just want to welcome Eric Gibbons. And thank you very, very much for being here today, Eric. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me. And it's it's great to see Chris even virtually. We do the uh, the national I art know, education I meetings know. and stuff. Yeah. I know every time we talk about how much we miss seeing everybody face to face. So I am going to turn over the stage to you and um, I will go quiet and then I'll jump in with some questions as they come up. Excellent. Excellent. Well, um, as Chris said, uh, we're kind of talking now. Uh, let's see. Make sure I don't have to click anything here. Okay. Nope. Good. <laughs> I'm good. So um, the emotional color wheel is something that it's it's an idea that color and shape uh, all have emotional values. So um, I'm trying to think of a way of how we get students to kind of understand this and incorporate this into their own work. There are simple ways of doing it and complex ways of doing it, but the nice thing about it is that it automatically uh, creates the sense of choice and difference within what the students are working on. So you can take an even simple project and incorporate some of these ideas so that every student's exploration comes out differently. Um, when I see a classroom full of objects that all look so similar, it's hard to tell who it is, I usually reevaluate that project. Um, for the color wheel, the emotional color wheel has kind of been my way, one of my ways of differentiating the work and the students to then be able to apply this to themselves to be introspective about it but also to apply it to other things which is really nice when you tie this into art history so i'm going to kind of go through the book i'm not really going to read it um, because the, the ideas and the concepts should come through pretty clearly um, chris mentioned there are two versions of the book this was the primary edition um, that i created and then i realized it might look a little kiddish for the older kids, so I created a more uh, simplified version that's less kiddy-like. Um, but this, they're both awesome and, and good to use. 
So we're just going to go through some ideas. Um, if you happen to have some sketch paper around and, you know, maybe some colored pencils or crayons or whatever, um, that might be helpful because I am going to give you a couple of little tasks so you can apply this information. Now, we're going to be talking about, about it as a person, um, but this can be applied to an event. Um, it can be applied to a situation. Uh, it can be applied to dynamics between people, um, but I'm just going to use the idea of a person and we'll talk a little bit more about how it can be applied outside of that. So um, this was kind of my little emotional color wheel that I did as kind of a, a, a quickie guide for my students. So I have a poster like this and um, Chris will have that in the in the packet if you decide that's something um, you want to have. Um, but this way you can kind of see some basics of, you know, some of the emotional values that we're going to talk about and explore here. So let's start simple, okay? Um, we know that uh, a line is kind of the most simple thing in art, and then lines connect and create shapes. So every shape in the universe uh, can be created from the triangle, the circle, and square. I'm going to cut off the top of my head because the book is the most important part. Um, and then when we look at the shapes, we can start to make some associations. So triangles uh, tend to be very sharp. Um, they can cut. Um, they can be more aggressive. Uh, they tend to be used for tools or to cut things. So in the book, I kind of talk about how uh, you could see that um, triangles can be uh, scary, frightening, dangerous, hurtful, painful, and sharp. A dragged line. Uh, or pattern could represent such a thing. So if you knew a person who was kind of sharp in their personality or kind of aggressive, then instead of saying those things about the person and writing out words to kind of describe them, you could use a triangle as a symbol. And then um, you can even think about companies that want to show off their aggressiveness and being forward. And you can see some logos here of companies that use the triangle to kind of show that aggressive stance, that it's forward and supposed to be grabbing your attention. Okay. So that's a basic understanding of a triangle. And little kids, older kids, everybody can kind of get that. It makes intuitive sense. So circles, we look at balloons, a hula hoop, a frisbee, a bubble, uh, a ball, and all of these things are playful, safe, fun, um, so if you use lines that are curly or uh, rounded, they can represent those kinds of things too. So if you have a person in your life that is uh, playful, fun, safe, soft, then you could use a circle to kind of represent their emotional values. So again, we're getting away from the idea of using words and using shapes to kind of represent that. And here are some circle logos that are supposed to show off playful, fun, safe uh, to get across. And even politically, you know, they were, they're used um, to kind of emulate whatever it is the party wants to show off. So it's, you know, we can have some connections there. Um, so we can see that certainly with the Olympics, you know, it's playful, it's sporty, it's supposed to be fairly safe. And last one, the square. We can see we've got blocks, boxes, a house, a shelf, desks, stairs. So these things uh, tend to be strong, stable, dependable, and boring. So if you got a box, I tell the kids, if you get a box for your birthday, you know, a box is okay. You know, you can put stuff in it, but you're not gonna be excited by it. So it's, it's functional, it's useful. And do you have people in your life that are also functional, useful, dependable, strong? And certainly those emotional values could be used to describe people. So again, if you wanted to describe someone that was like that, then you could use square-based shapes. And then these again, you'll see a lot of banks um, will use square-based shapes, uh, financial companies, but then sometimes you'll see these combos like Lego, you've got a square shape that represents, you know, the stability in building and architecture, but then the word Lego is written in a fun font that's rounded and circular. So by mixing shapes, you can kind of get some nuance into what it is you're trying to say emotionally through the colors and the shapes that are going on. So 
the next step is then how do we apply this basic sort of information? So we can take um, shapes and kind of combine them to represent yourself uh, or another person, again, or a situation. But we're going to stick to people for this uh, for this demonstration. So um, if you have a very complex personality, then you would be encouraged to create a complex sort of shape. Um, you probably have more than one characteristic in your personality. So um, you'll probably have a combination of shapes to create a new shape that would represent you. So if you have that scrap paper, uh, crayon, pencil, whatever around, I want you, I challenge you to make or draw a shape that represents your personality, or you could pick someone else to do. So for me, um, I tend to be kind of a playful person. I'd like to have some fun. So I take the circle and the square because I'm a teacher, I need to be dependable. And I created a shape um, that looks like that. So here's my shape. I didn't go too complicated. I could have, but this is an elementary book. So I want to keep it simple. So the square represents me as a teacher being dependable. And then the rounded parts are my sense of humor. Now I don't have a lot of triangles in me and my students know I'm not a yeller. I'm a whisperer and that's very dangerous when I whisper maybe in class, but I, I don't believe in yelling, uh, you know, unless somebody's life is in danger or somebody's playing with an exacto blade. So I, I have very little uh, triangle, you know, kind of in my personality. Now on a subliminal level, I noticed that these triangle points kind of go inward and maybe I have some self issues, you know, with anger turned towards myself being highly critical. So you could even subliminally say that's going in there. That wasn't my intent, but as I look at it, I'm like, mm, maybe. So take a moment and then just on your scrap paper, if you happen to have some, um, draw a shape combination that kind of represents you. You don't want to take a lot of time with it um, as we're going through. So as you're doing that, um, drawing a little shape, I'll go into now the color portion of it. Shape's pretty simple, straightforward, triangle, circle, square. Um, and you can see that now you can represent a person um, with one of those shapes. You could even extend that. And in the back of the book, I'll show you this, where you could do a whole family and create a family dynamic where each family member is done with a shape. Um, you could even put patterns of shapes between the people to represent how they get along or don't get along. Or the position on the page represents who's closer, you know, in relationship and who's kind of on the outside. Um, I've done this with students and they were able to use shapes to represent a family member who had passed. So then they can get to an even deeper level with the social emotional learning and still feel safe because you don't have to tell anybody what that shape is. As the artist, you know what that shape is. So it allows you to express that and still feel safe. And when I assess the work of my students, I let them, they can, they can be as vague or as specific as they need to be. As long as I understand they use the circle shape to represent, you know, a soft or fun personality. A triangle shape represents something that's aggressive. As long as I know that they're making those connections, we're good. So we're gonna move on to shape or color, I'm sorry. And I like to point out to my students um, this odd thing that almost every stop sign in the world, maybe in the universe, is red and why red? There has to be a reason, okay? It isn't just that stop sign companies only have red paint, there's a reason for it. Red is a very attention getting sort of color, but why is that? So there are these, the research that I did for this shows that there are some international accepted, maybe base human ideas of why certain colors represent certain things. Culturally, there will be some little shifts, but maybe our inner caveman, we see red, and I challenge my students, why do we use red? Why is red considered the most eye-catching sort of color? And once in a while, a kid will raise their hand and say, well, is it blood? And yeah, um, if you are on the top of a mountain, um and you're going over a path and you see some red in the path you're not going to think oh somebody dropped some ketchup you're going to be like oh my god i think that's blood i better look for the tiger and run away so it's one of these primal sort of things and that's what um you know the colors and shapes that i've researched for this book 
are kind of tying into. And then we have other things, you know, like fire trucks, um, uh, fire hydrants, you know, things that are really going to catch your attention uh, with this red in there. So red tends to be the most aggressive color. Um, it's representing something dangerous, kind of shocking. So if you wanted to say that somebody was dangerous, aggressive, potentially shocking, you know, that there's some real danger there, you could use red. And, you know, I talk about, you know, we probably need to temper it. I mean, if somebody was a red triangle, they're probably in prison right now. Um, you know, we can have a little red in ourselves, but, don't, you know, temper it. Think about there's other colors that we're going to be dealing with. So red is our most aggressive color, and that's kind of an international thing. So our next color is orange. And my best um, example for that is kind of the stove burner. So the stove burner is, um, you know, there's a, it, it's very helpful to us. You know, we can certainly cook uh, with that and we can make nourishing meals with that. Um, but we always warn our, you know, little ones, don't touch it, you're gonna get burned. So there's a certain aggressive energy about orange, but it's also very useful. So I play around with this idea that red is murder, uh, but maybe orange is um, like, boxing where you know somebody might get hurt so it's it's very aggressive but it's not deadly so we have some other things around here that are going to kind of represent the aggressiveness and the high energy of orange so if you are an aggressive person with a lot of high energy um maybe extremely useful but like you got to be careful around that person orange might be the color to you to represent that we move on to yellow and kind of the international obvious symbol is the sun. I mean, it's white light, we can make that argument, but really most cultures are sort of representing the sun as yellow. And yellow tends to be this bright color. It's high energy, but it's not dangerous in any way. So again, I, I use this analogy of sports. You got red as your boxing. Um, yellow, might be, um, uh, yellow might be more baseball. Okay, orange might be football where you're tackling people and somebody could get hurt, but yellow is going to be more, more passive. It's, it's got energy, but it's not dangerous kind of energy. So again, for somebody who's playful, happy, the sun is life-giving. So life-giving is another good uh, word for that. Uh, friendly, um, positive, that's a color that you would use to kind of represent um, that personality. Green, definitely more chill. Um, eat your vegetables because vegetables are healthy. So it's a good color for health, growth. Um, and we can see over here that I've kind of written about it, that it's calm, positive, happy, helps us grow, nurturing. So green is that kind of a color. So if you felt like you were a nurturing and helpful kind of person, you could use green somewhere inside of your shape to kind of represent that part of your personality. And again, you can see none of these are making you doubt your sanity or anything. These kind of make natural sense. So it's not very hard for students to kind of get this information and kind of run with it because it makes it makes sense. Um, even through my research, I was, you know, all the time I was coming across things that, yeah, that makes sense. So uh, blue, uh, color of the sky. So it surrounds us. It's very vast. Uh, same thing with the ocean, lakes, and rivers. Uh, it's reflective, very cool. Um, it's not a high energy kind of thing. So um, yellow may be baseball, uh, green might be uh, badminton or croquet or something like that, and then blue might be checkers, <laughs> you know, for activity level. So uh, blue is calm, relaxing, friendly, quiet, happy. Uh, if yellow is a laugh, green would be a chuckle, and blue would be a smile. So definitely more chill. Um, you can't live without water, so you know that's one of those life-giving colors too. But it tends to be the more quiet one. Purple. Um, we go into this idea of sunsets, royalty. Um, the vastness of space, sometimes the deepest part of the oceans can kind of be red as sort of purple. So it's a very quiet color. It's deep, it's still, it's peaceful. 
um, maybe even a color for shyness, um, very dignified. So again, that might be a color that works uh, to represent part of your personality. Now, there are obviously more colors than that. So we're gonna hit some of these very briefly um, and they can be good, good accents uh, in your shape to represent yourself. So black is going to be representing mystery or unknown. So I try very carefully to get away from the idea that black is evil or something like that because it can have some cultural connotations that we, we don't necessarily wanna be putting into what our students are going through. So we talk about, it's more like the unknown. If you go into a dark room, you close the windows, close the doors and you can't see anything, you might feel uneasy because you don't know what's going on. So it's really the color of unknown or mystery. So when you don't know what's going on, that's a good color to kind of use. Um, or if you're hiding something, you know, you put it in the dark so nobody can see it. So that becomes helpful. White tends to be our color of spirituality because it's associated with the sky and the clouds. Uh, foam, mist, so it is also a mysterious color. It can also be a very cold color when you're thinking about snow and ice. Um, and a lot of cultures use white to represent spirits or ghosts. So it can be the color of spirituality, okay? I'm, again, I'm avoiding the idea of goodness in some way, you know, having this black and white, good and evil kind of thing going on there. Really, it's more about spirituality. Uh, purity can be another thing that's used that way. Uh, it can be a color of faith, uh, which can be uh, in a few of my words. Gray is sort of makes sense as kind of that in-between color. It's not black, it's not white, white, so it can be an indecisive color, but it can also be a very strong color when you're thinking about stone and building materials. So it's very strong, it's very stable, it's very heavy, uh, it's massive but it can also be kind of the, um, you know, undecided. Um, so people who kind of feel in between, middle child syndrome maybe. Um, brown, now some kids react quickly to brown and like, oh, that's bad, it's dirty, it's, it's not. It's really, if you think about it and tie it to farming, then you know that it's nurturing, um, there's a lot of potential. If you put seeds in the ground, they're gonna grow and make you know nourishing food for everybody, or you can plow salt into the fields and kind of ruin it. So it's really potential, it can go kind of either way. Um, the bark of trees, you know, leather gloves, hard working. So as soon as you tie brown to farming, seeds and growth, then they kind of get that idea that it is a, a positive color um, of hard work. So if you're a hard working individual, you're putting in a lot of labor, a lot of sweat equity into what you're doing, then brown can be that, that color. It can also be the person who's very patient and working. So if you can work on a project over time and see it to fruition, brown might be the color for that. Gold is the color of uh, royalty, riches, um, special events, um, being number one, you know, achievement, those kinds of things. Silver is kind of the wealth of the everyday man. So it's the work of the mercantile people, the everyday people kind of working, but it's also a color of technology when you start thinking about, you know, the internet and the wires and all of that kind of stuff. So um, those are kind of our, our color combinations. Now my elementary book goes into some cultural things where, you know, like red in China is used as a wedding color, um, so, you know, it'll have some different connotations there. There we go. I know I skipped a page. <laughs> Excuse me. So, uh, you know, in China, red is the color for weddings because it's a color that stands out. In Korea, green is used for weddings. Uh, black, uh, Montea, for you know, the women wear this veil. Um, in Morocco, it's gold. Uh, in India, it's very celebratory, so many colors, and in Europe and the United States, for the most part, we have a lot of white. So cultural differences can uh, influence color. So if you want to tie that into, I sometimes will have students look up their culture and then incorporate cultural colors into the work that they're creating. So, you know, there can be different sort of connotations depending on culture, uh, you know, for colors. And just briefly kind of show, you know, uh, orange, we've got that with some uh, Asian religions, uh, fall, uh, yellow, cowardice, but it's also the color of the emperor in China, and taxis, uh, let's see, 
uh, blue. Some people jump right away to sadness and it is sort of that, but it isn't really internationally. Um, but we can kind of see that with Picasso's work, but it's also the color to pr of protection, you know, for the evil eye uh, in the Middle East. And let's see, I think we got purple here is color of mourning. Yep, and the color of power uh, and remembrance and recycling. So let's look back at our shape. And then I want you now to color in your shape with the colors and patterns you think would represent you. Um, so I've done that over here. So I use blue to kind of represent that I am a relaxed person. Um, I'm life-giving, you know, to my students and to my spouse. I put little yellow circles in it to kind of represent my sense of humor. So they're kind of like little bubbles. Green, because as a teacher, I help my students grow, but I'm always growing and learning and publishing through my books and stuff. So that I use some green in there. And I made sure the colors are kind of flowing. I didn't have some stark contrast between them. I wanted to show this idea of softness um, in my approach. Yellow again, because I tend to see the positive things in life with some blue for humor. And then the bottom part is um, brown because I'm very hardworking. So not only am I teaching, I'm also publishing, I am writing, I'm painting, sculpting, all that kind of stuff. So I'm a pretty busy guy. So these kinds of things would represent me as a teacher artist. So on your papers, if you're sketching out um, some idea for yourself, you know, this can be kind of an example uh, of that. So we play around with those kinds of ideas um, with my students. So we could do a self-portrait. This could be great for an elementary level student so that they get the basic ideas of working in abstract expressionism. And a lot of people think like, oh, abstract expressionism, let's go outside and we're gonna splash some paint on a canvas. And then afterwards, what did they learn? Well, they learned it was fun to go outside and splash paint, but what colors did you pick? Why did you pick those colors? Students after they do this can come back to you and talk to you about, I picked blue because of this. I picked yellow because of this. I did a, uh, a rounded line because of this, that, and the other. And you could see that if every student in the classroom was creating a self-portrait that was a shape and a color combination, no two images would be the same. So this forces individuality into what it is you're doing. And if you wanna have your, your you know teaching portion in there, um, you can certainly talk about, you know, how you want to color in with parallel lines. We can even layer, we can throw in some semblance of shadow um, when you're working with the shapes and things like that if you want to. Um, but this is a great way to incorporate individuality in what the students are doing. You can expand this and then do a family. So let's see if I have, I have an example of that here. Here we go. So this was a student doing their family. And I had them um, choose colors in between the family members to represent how they get along or don't get along. So we can see between these two top shapes, there's some red, orange kind of going in between. So they have some, some issues going on there. I don't know what that issue is. I don't remember, it's been years ago, but I know there's something going on. And then um, I think we have the student here, they're pretty complex. You know, they've got some anger issues sort of going on, um, but we've got some chill parts, some growth parts. Um, they, we can see who they get along most with, you know, this kind of ear sort of shape over here. We've got the green kind of in between. And then there's some mystery in this person. So they don't know everything about that person. Something is kind of hidden. It looks like it's jagged edged around the black. So maybe they're trying to say that they have this aggressive side to them, but they don't know why. So as you grow up, we start to learn more and more about our parents or grandparents. Um, and they go from being these godlike figures to these human figures. Um, and then we have the other shapes sort of going on. Why, why is one in the corner? I don't know, but certainly the student would. And they were purposeful in doing this. And now we have a completely abstract work of art that represents something very unique to that student. And they can come back and talk to you about it to show their understanding. So when I'm grading something like this, I'm grading their use of material. So in this case, it was watercolor, though it could have been marker crayon, whatever it is that you know I had available. 
Um, and then I'm also grading, did they understand what it is that they were doing? If they tell me that, oh, I made it orange because orange is their favorite color, then they didn't get it. Um, what I'm looking for is an understanding that they are thoughtfully incorporating um, the colors and shapes into their representation of the person. But you can reverse this and look at famous works of art and then have students kind of discuss what do the colors potentially mean. So we know in Starry Night, um, you know, he used a lot of blues and contrasting colors in this. So what might that mean? And I think you can have a really interesting discussion with your students in looking at artwork and going beyond just the pictorial representation and thinking about, well, what, what might he have done here? Because we know um, that Van Gogh was starting to use colors in an expressionist sort of way. His work led to people like Picasso um, because he wasn't necessarily using colors for their, um, um, because the you know the sky isn't blue at night you know he did that for an emotional value and you can even take an image and maybe do a contrast you know reverse some of the colors change some of the colors how does that change the meaning of the work how would you repaint it to feel um how your life is going you know if you had to do your own starry night what colors would you choose to kind of represent you know that so there are some ways to kind of apply this idea of color and shape into famous works of art or exploring uh, schools of art, styles of art um, that can then be highly personalized for the student. You can even take um, work like this one by Kandinsky, which is non-objective. There's, we know that he did not put anything necessarily in this specific imagery. So now students can look at this work and maybe before understanding that colors and shapes can be specifically expressive, you know, they would look at it, I don't know, a bunch of lines, a bunch of shapes, I don't get it, you know, it doesn't mean anything. But then with this information, now they can start to look at these lines and shapes and colors and maybe make some judgments as they critique a famous work of art. So it adds that extra layer of understanding um, that I think could be really helpful in the classroom and applied. So when you're doing um, a portrait project, do you have to use the actual skin tone or can you use something um, that's going to be more expressive of how that person feels or if you have two people in it can the colors between the people represent their relationship um, so we can take that to the next level and one way i've done this with my students very successfully is just silhouettes and i've done this for uh, seven-year-olds all the way through my advanced high school students and they all do really well with it which is kind of remarkable um, where we just have them stand up in front of a projector with uh, you know a white paper there and we have another student trace their shadow and then the inside of the face is representing how they feel about themselves and the outside is representing how they view the outside world or how they feel the outside world views them. So they, they get a lot of choice in this. So sometimes, well, all the time, I start out with students making a list of their personality traits and their points of view, and they can be very vague if they want to. I mean, I got a little rainbow action going on in this space. Is that necessarily representing a student who's struggling with LGBT issues or not? It's up to them to reveal however much they want to when you're assessing a project. You know, I have them sit down, we talk about it, and they'll say, you know, that maybe they have a colorful personality. That's fine, they can be vague. Um, or they can, you know, say what it is that they're, they're feeling. But as long as that when they talk to me about their work, that things are sort of connecting, that they're using triangles because there's something aggressive going on in there or it's stable, but stable and strong, but also sharp, you know, that might be more of a diamond, that we're seeing these little um, patterns in the green to represent growth. Well, why did you choose to do that? As soon as students start saying, well, green's my favorite color, then I know they didn't quite get it. They're not really applying the information. But as soon as they start saying things like, well, I, I chose blue because I tend to be very calm. Um, here they put blue in there. Uh, their chin to kind of represent maybe the words coming out tend to be more calm and thoughtful, whereas this person, 
you know, might be a little bit more flowy and flowery with, you know, how they're speaking about things. So there's really great ways that you can apply these concepts to other projects to use color and shape to express more than just the image, that we can go kind of beyond that. Let me take a look at some other ones here. Um, so on the bottom, I mean, we're talking about, you know, the coronavirus. I had students create a virus. They had to research viruses and microbes, and then we created sculptures. And then they researched what are the symptoms of that particular virus or microbe or whatever. And then they chose colors and shapes and patterns to represent how it physically manifests in a person. So again, that extra layer of research, now it becomes expressive. It's not pink because I like pink, it's pink because it's maybe attacking blood cells in a certain way. And then the student can kind of take me through their thought process as they're working on stuff like that. Here we've got, you know, a mandala, uh, but done as a sun design. I think we used uh, rubber cement and a little plunger and did the lines and then we watercolored over that, or it could be white crayon as well. Um, I can't remember from this particular image. So um, the book has lots and lots of other options, but you, you know, uh, there are lots of ways that you can kind of apply this concept. And then um, Chris will have a, a, a poster available uh, in the kit and we have some stuff uh, available that are helpful in the classroom because when they see this, they don't have to reread the whole book. They kind of know, oh yeah, triangles are aggressive and angry. Uh, purple is kind of chill. Mm -hmm. So Chris, did you have any questions there that, that popped up in our discussion? Because I think I've hit all the main- A lot points. of questions. So I'll, awesome. um, I'll come back and join you face-to-face -face here and share some of those questions. Nice job and thank you so much. I enjoyed, um, I think it was last year during the um, you know, Art Education Association conferences, um, you were, um, a guest in the NASCO booth, and you are also doing a workshop in North Carolina and on the emotional color wheel. And I was there and it was fabulous. And so um, I've been playing right along with you. So a couple of the questions that we have um, before I share some of the other resources here um, is how long did it take you to um, write and research um, the emotional color wheel book? Okay. Well, it I'd been doing this with my students for probably, gosh, it must be 20 years now. And every year I would be able to find a little bit more information through research as the internet became, you know, more, more rigorous, I guess. Um, I could find more research. So you can actually look up the emotional values of color. And then I started adding in these cultural connections because I, I love talking about culture and it's a great way to kind of individualize students' work because they can they can look up well you know my family is german and irish okay so let's look up germany and irish and emotional colors and then you can incorporate some of those as kind of your bonus color okay so we have the colors that are represented in the emotional color wheel and these tend to be kind of general um but if somebody's from china they might represent red instead of as anger and aggression they might represent it as getting attention or um, wedding, you know, that kind of thing. So some cultures will have some slight twists to the colors that they use that are, are completely valid. I wrote a side note on that. It's awesome because it is absolutely conversation starters. And particularly as you start bringing in um, ethnicity and culture and, you know, marketing and all of that kind of stuff, you can start to sort of figure out why they used certain colors. So I love that. Lots of questions about, is the book available virtually? Um, I believe there is a Kindle version of the book on Amazon. Okay, so there you go for that, but. Also during the pandemic um, with Firehouse Publications, we've allowed people to use this on the internet to teach their students. So that is fantastic. During, Thank you for that. So during the pandemic, all of our books, they can be used over the internet with your students as long as it's not publicly available, like you can't read the book on YouTube and monetize it or something like that. But if you're using it as a teaching tool, 
um, yeah. during the pandemic, we're allowing that to, to take That's place. That's so cool. Thank you for that. The thing too that um, that you have almost downplayed a little bit is in the back of the book, um, there's like 20 um, like quick and dirty um, lesson plans, like just a, yep. a, a paragraph on a lesson plan that gives you this beautiful opportunity to take this idea and then make it into either a virtual lesson plan or um, in classroom lesson plan um, prompts that you can give students, which I think is fantastic too. One of the other questions was um, beginning of the year, do you, do you ever start this as a beginning of the year project, like the, the, the project you took us through, the lesson you took us through? It's, it certainly could be used that way. I think you may need a little time to kind of get to know your students um, so they understand that you might be working in this different sort of mode. So I generally will do it in uh, October after we've gotten, I do a, you know, a self-portrait thing. So I, I try and figure out, well, what are their skills right now? Um, then help them see that they can build up their skills. And then I move into something social emotional learning. So for me personally, I like to go from something concrete to something abstract to back to concrete to back to abstract. So we get to kind of work those uh, creative muscles with the students. But you could certainly start this off. Um, it's, it's very laid back where they could be representing, you know, a situation, representing their summer experience through color and shape, their COVID experience through color and shape. Um, sure. I've been, so yeah. one of the questions too is, um, you know, as you did your research on colors, um, sometimes people want to give like colors choices so um like for elementary students allowing them to define their choice of colors as it relates to how they feel um mm -hmm. and maybe they choose red and it's not anger or danger um talk a little bit about that you know like the and maybe where your research came from well, um, some of this stuff comes from actually as far back as the 1800s um, with artists sort of defining color and shape. So there is some some stuff out there that you can find. It, you know, this will align nicely with some of that older information. But um, I'm reminded of an old story of a kid who was put into therapy because they were using a black crayon to do Easter bunnies. And they thought, oh, the kid's depressed. And they finally asked the kid, why did they use you know, black for the bunnies. And it was it was the only crayon left because all the kids took the pretty colors. So, <laughs> you know, sometimes you can read too much into it. But certainly, you know, if a student chooses a red, you can ask why. And then you might learn something kind of interesting. Oh, my mom used red lipstick today and I just thought it was so pretty. So I wanted to use red. That's fine. You know, that comes from your own personal experience. Sometimes it's even fun to have kids analyze the clothes that they're wearing on that day that you're making the presentation and figure out, do the colors align to their emotional values of the day? And sometimes they do in surprising sort of ways. Um, I think often when you go to a closet and you're paying attention, you're picking what you like, sometimes it's because of your emotional values that day, you know, and how you're seeing your world around you. So it's it's fun to kind of apply. So I, I use this as kind of like a spice in the lesson. It doesn't have to necessarily be the meal. Um, so it's okay to deviate from this, but it's nice if students have um, a base point to work from, and then they're making thoughtful choices as they go. They're not picking blue just because I like blue. I'm picking blue because you know I'm feeling very chill today, or I need to represent something that's very calm. Now they have a vocabulary that they can work from. Picasso, as a child, could draw and paint nearly photographically. His his. Uh, picture of the first Holy Communion that he did of this little girl was just phenomenally realistic. But once he knew those base rules, then he could break all the rules. So here are some rules, and then you can break them as you see fit. And it's a great way to kind of incorporate that individuality because now, you know, people are thinking about their choices of colors. Now they're pulling from themselves or from their cultures or whatever it is you've chosen. 
Excellent. Thank you so, so much. And we are getting tons of questions. One of them also, and I'm not 100% sure how to read this, based on your experience, will this engage 9 to 12? And I know that you teach high school. Um, instead of an opportunity to play, which are not in art room. So I'm guessing, would you ever see this being used um, in another subject area besides art? I'm hoping that's what you mean. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely. And I, like I said, I've done this for, I've definitely done this lesson for ages seven through 16. Every summer I'd, I'd run a summer camp for about 25 years. Uh, but with my high school students and even my AP students, when they're kind of stuck for color choices, then we fall back on this and say, well, look, how about we try and think about using colors that are expressing what it is you're trying to get through in the work that you're doing. They don't always have to apply it, but it's always a great place to go because sometimes students are stuck. Like, well, what color do I use for the background? Well, what are you trying to portray and what colors would best represent that? You know, and do you want to contrast it? You know, is there some anger, but there's also some mystery. So maybe we've got some red and we've got some black. So it's a it's a place to kind of start and hopefully incorporate. And you can use this in almost any subject. Um, you know, as you're thinking about historical events, you know, why not use color to kind of represent the good side and the, the bad side, or maybe there's no good and bad side. There's just different points of view you know, in these battles and then rep using color to kind of represent that, you know. Sure. Also, um, do you discuss the cultural component when you offer um, the emotional values? Um, she says, I ask for an incredibly diverse cultural student groups. Absolutely. There are a lot of projects that I do that pull from students. They need to, I have like handouts in my art students workbook, which I've Actually, I happen to have a copy here. So I have these worksheets that kind of help students, um, you know, kind of work through ideas first on paper, and then they can kind of sketch out things. So here's the family one, you know, so I'm using, uh, you know, the students can kind of write down their family members' initials, write down four words to describe them, and then in the margin, I've got some space for them to do the color and shape combinations. So a lot of my publications have this kind of overlapping sort of thing going on there. So the emotional color wheel can be used that way. But also as they're discussing, um, you know, culture. So who am I uh, is one of these projects where they're talking about what they know about themselves and what others think about them. Um, and then another one where they're exploring, um, you know, their heritage and then doing some research that way so that they can see um, you know, if they're pulling from Germany or Russia or, you know, China or whatever, that they can then give them an opportunity to get online, do a little research for symbols, uh, you know, and incorporate that into their work. And that lends itself to individuality, because if you have a very diverse group of students, which I do, teaching in an urban setting right now, um, you know, that's great. And it also gives them that sense of pride, because now they're learning more about their culture instead of making some, you know, assumptions. Yeah. And I imagine every time you do this, you may come up with new information or something culturally that you didn't know before or whatever. Absolutely. You know, it's it's been educational even for me, uh, you know, to kind of learn about these things. Sometimes we'll even incorporate animals from cultures. Um, you know, if a student is very uh, athletic or whatever, they pick an athletic animal, but from their cultural heritage, and then we can incorporate colors into that. So again, it it reinforces this idea of individuality through their work, but then they can come back and explain it to you. I chose the, the German wolf because of this, or I chose the Chinese, you know, mythological creature because of that. Um, and then they chose these colors because of this. So it, it it's nice that they're being thoughtful in their process and it's just not arbitrary stuff that they're really thinking through these, these pieces and parts and then can um, you know, show their problem solving uh, in that assessment process. Fantastic. What's the youngest grade that you have done that you think really understands the concept of color and emotion? I, honest, I, I, I totally believe this can be even done on a kindergarten level. Maybe you just limit it to shapes and we create a shape 
uh, that kind of represents who we are. And they can keep it very, very simple. And then you can go to the, the simple idea of colors. You, maybe you just do, you know, the primary and secondary colors. And then they can, you know, get a construction paper. Well, I'm a blue circle. So they cut out a blue circle and then they get to put that down. They can put a little face on it or something. But each kid will then be able to apply that to themselves. These concepts are, are very easy and can be simplified for a kindergartner group. But again, I'll have that the same concepts now beefed up uh, for a high school group. But absolutely, I, I've done this with, um, you know, five and six year olds, no problem. And they love it. They're like, I'm a blue circle. I'm a red triangle today, you know. <laughs> and we could joke around. Yes, you are. <laughs> you know. That is but fabulous. I love that. I and, and no doubt, because even in a room full of um, art educators, people were getting pretty excited about their shape um, as well. We are nearing the end, and I definitely want to show the um, the poster. Um, in so in the in your side panel of the go to webinar, you should have a panel that has a tab that says handouts, and in that handout is um, Eric's website, his YouTube channel. Um, it says that the um, the kit is coming, um, part number NE20024. I think we typed that in the questions. Um, we are putting the kit together and we um, will post it on our website with pictures. Um, and I'll get a top view of the poster. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of what the poster looks like. Um, it's not huge, but it's nice um, for a quick reference to have it on hand or to put up in your classroom. Um, not even that difficult, even if you were um, doing some virtual learning, you could probably point to different things and talk about it. But a lot of information on here and just sort of quick reference for students when they are creating, creating other works of art as well. I um, definitely played with, um, Eric's assignment and created um, my very own shape, which ended up coming out looking like a cupcake, by the way. I was utilizing um, the products that come in the, um, the basic kit. I shouldn't call it the basic kit, but it's called um, Art Kit in a Bag. And it comes with a whole bunch of um, just nice colored pencils, watercolors, um, markers, crayons, scissors, a Sharpie, kind of nice if you're in a um, distance learning situation. The nice part about the bag is that you are able to um, put like a book in there. You're able to put some handouts in there. So um, in this particular case, I chose to use it because I wanted you to be able to see um, how it worked and that the colors are vibrant and do a really nice job. Um, Eric, you do have lots of other books and I did list the ones that NASCO sells in the list that on the handout. Um, but if you wanna talk just a few minutes about a couple of the other books, um, we've got about five more minutes. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, the, the, the one that does really well and I think lends itself to a classroom situation uh, is the If Picasso series. So that seems to work really well with, again, a broad range of ages. You know, I teach K to 12. So a lot of the stuff that I create is good for many, many age groups and I can either beef it up or simplify things. So um, the one that does really well for us is If Picasso Went to the Zoo. And this was written with 50 other art teachers from all over the world. We each took uh, an animal uh, from the world and then a famous artist with an alliteration. So this is Picasso polar bears. And uh, I created poems to kind of go along with each of the pieces so that students can learn about art history, uh, but also the styles of art. So we've got the Picasso polar bears and then underneath the polar bears, there's a little leaf 
and the light green means that they're endangered. Um, so we have thriving, threatened, endangered, or extinct. So the color of the leaf will tell you that. And then the poem next to it actually goes wrong with Twas the Night Before Christmas, that sort of sing-songy way. So if Pablo Casso went to the zoo, is this the kind of painting he'd do? Polar bear ladies, les demoiselles, I wonder what secrets they might just tell. Of the artist Picasso and his way of painting, breaking down shapes, there is no mistaking. This style called cubism is what he created, a new way of painting. At first it was hated. People complain that's not how it looks, but Pablo now loved his pictures so big. So we've got lots of different artists kind of represented. Um, Archimboldo, Arctic hare. Uh, we've got a Liechtenstein leopard. Um, Jean-Michel Basquiat, buffalo. So we made sure to make sure it's balanced with both male and female artists. Um, so Lee Krasner, uh, koala bear, and um, different cultures, that kind of thing. So lots and lots. And then in the back of the book, we've got a website where you can download 15 lesson plans for each book. So we've got land animals, sea creatures, if Picasso went to the sea, uh, if Picasso went on vacation, where we have different locations around the world, um, different styles, and then you get to see where in the world it is. And the last two lines of the poem teach the students how to say yes, no, and hello in that language. Um, yeah, and you can I read one that. and do a lesson. You know, they're a lot of fun. So those uh, NASCO carries and does very well with those. Um, and they're great for a sub plan or for a whole lesson. And like I said, each book has like 15 lessons in the back. And then we have other support stuff you know, for subs and all that kind of stuff. So these are things that I use in my classroom and have been making available to teachers for years now. Perfect. Well, we are down to the last three minutes. And so um, I want to um, first remind everybody that um, Eric Gibbons, um, also known as the Art Ed Guru. So um, the artedguru.com is his website in your handout um, on the side panel, and I'm just pointing to my laptop here, is a spot for handouts. Click on that before you log out and um, download it. It's got all of the information. It's got all the books that we carry. Um, the emotional color wheel, you know, you guys are seriously the first to um, hear about the kit that's gonna have the poster in it. It's gonna have a variety of um, color drawing tools. Um, I should have brought the list, but um, we were down to the wire this morning of even putting a part number to it. So stay tuned, keep coming back to um, nascoeducation.com to look for that. We will also try to post it on um, our social media, Instagram, and um, um, which is at NASCO Arts and also um, NASCO Art Education Facebook page. Um, the books are available at um, nascoeducation.com. The kit that I was referring to today was um, some kits that we have put together um, for back to school, thinking that maybe teachers need an indiv individualized kit. If you go to um, nascoeducation.com, you will actually see um, a kid with paint on their hands, which I know drives art teachers a little bit crazy, but it's bright and colorful and it definitely um, points out that these are the kits. If you click on that, there's lots of different, all the way from a super economy to um, the zippered bag with product in it. I know that not everybody knows what they have going on yet. So as soon as you do fill us in, um, talk to us a little bit in the survey questions and let us know how we can help. Eric, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being the art ed guru and always being willing to share everything that you have. His blog is outstanding. Um, he has been all over the world. He's very multicultural, very diverse understanding and compassionate and his shape that he showed you truly represents who he is. Um, I would love to hear more about what you're interested in doing, but come back next week. Maker Monday is going to be on blind contour drawing. It's super fun. Um, Karen Crosby, a retired art educator who also teaches at the collegiate level will join us and um, 
I'm super excited about that. Eric, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. Um, be well, stay safe, be happy, and keep teaching art.